So the, some hard copies are here. Four people said yes on Discord. But I heard it seven last time. And seven people took that. I don't know. Maybe nobody's taking it. It's kind of kind of weird. Two people took it. 
So we'll finish off this chapter. Oh, yeah, yeah. We didn't do the uh, single noitering uh -huh. Let's remember that. Man, can you remind me? Because yeah. <laughs> we'll talk more about spectrum analyzer as well, because I have this sheet I posted under the, I think it's called spectrum analyzer, one sheet. Yeah, let's finish this off. The reason we were looking at that was, do you remember the, uh, oh, what happened to Laurel? She couldn't give me the, uh, she's out there now, she's isolated. She's isolated, you kid. She's in the stream, she can hear you. So. Oh, 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 okay. Can you see the screen? <laughs> <laughs> so I gotta, I'll try to like write on, the, on here, right? Just better? Yeah. And then trying to go, I like it on the board, but remember the cover page? There was like this thing called the constellation. Evan said yes. Okay. Yes. There is like a constellation for digital communication, which we don't know anything about it yet, but it's on the cover page. The constellation is uh, <clears throat> where the signal is real and has an imaginary part as well in the analysis. And those four points in this particular case corresponded to four bit patterns. So if you want to send two bits, why is it blink? Uh, <clears throat> you want to send a zero, zero, you send this combination of I and Q, which are really cosine and sine of your, of your complex signal. You want to send those two bits, one and zero. Those two bits, zero, one, 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 that covers all the combinations, right? To all that modulation, Q, P, S, K, don't worry about that now. Q means quadrature, phase shift key. That'll mean a lot more much later. But the point is, how do you locate those points in that domain? Through trigonometry. Either regular or, uh, you know, the complex Euler. Cross Euler? Or, uh, how do you locate it? Through these basics. So that's one. <laughs> They're located. Is it blinking because of the the work my application or because of this It's only because it's, it's only blinking. Okay. So that's the motivation. There is another very strong motivation to look at trigonometric identities in a moment. That's to know what mixers do. In communication, mixers are a very important concept. Not the cookie mixer. Mm -hmm. Not audio mixing in the sound studio. There's something called frequency mixing in communications. So you should already know these, uh, this information. So we'll go through it uh, quickly. You know that if you are at an angle of theta up here, you could at a radius array, a uh, distance array away from the origin, you could project that point onto the x or y axis with cosine and sine. So that's no surprise, right? Sometimes it's nice when you're working something out to know that sine of negative theta is just negative sine theta. Sine, cosine of negative theta is gets rid of the sine. So let's look at a few identities. Oh, there's that blue box. That's what, why I'm using the word. The blue box has secrets underneath it, right? Okay, it has annotations. Let's look at a couple. Uh, so the summation of two angles and the difference of two angles, and just write them out. So when I was younger, we had to memorize that in school. You, know, you go, oh, cos AB equals cos, cos minus sine, sine. You got it all memorized, right? <clears throat> 
So that's the summation of two angles. What about the product? That's of more interest. I'll try to pull this down a little bit without being too. If you add those two first equations, right? The sine, the second term, sine alpha, sine beta will cancel. Can you hear me at home? How are they going to tell me? <laughs> so the product of two courses is that, right? You might say, big deal. Well, the deal is not so much the value of a half. Don't worry about that value. That's just to make it mathematically correct. The key thing here is if you multiply two coses, you get the summation and the difference. So if you take the product, you get the summation and the difference. What does a mixer in communications do? It takes the product. And the benefit is we can get a higher, so if these are two frequencies, A, alpha, and beta, we can get a higher one and a lower one. That's how you move your spectrum, your data, up to a higher spectrum to transmit, and how the receiver brings it back down through the mixing process. Make sense? <laughs> There's a special case if the two arguments were the same. Sometimes they are. So when they're the same, you just get a bit simpler. So take a look. Think about, don't look so much at the math. Just look at, oh, the first one was summer difference. This is also summer difference, but it's a little more unique. It's a double frequency and a DC term. That's how you can remember it. The same value, sorry, the same signal going into the mixer. Two sine waves, two cosine waves. If it's the same, you'll get a double frequency and a DC term. So the thing, I don't want you to remember so much the half term or whether that's a plus or minus here. Remember there's a plus and a minus, a sum and a difference, sum and a difference. That's the important thing. There's a sum and there's a difference. So we call that that uh, um, device in communication, we call it a mixer. Any system that's going out to the airwaves is going to mix your uh, information to a higher frequency at the transmitter, and it's going to mix it down back to what we call baseband at the receiver through this process. The mixer literally takes the sum and difference. What does it look like in a block diagram? 
two inputs, one output. That's a mixer. That X is very handy. It just means multiply, right? Easy to remember. Multiply. The mixer has two inputs and one output. And in your system, you got some end difference. You're going to keep one of them and get rid of one of the other ones. If you're transmitting and moving things to a higher frequency, what do you think you're going to get rid of? The difference. If you're bringing it back down at the receiver, you're going to get rid of the sum. How do you get rid of signals in general? Electrical signals. Okay. Filters. Yeah. Well, there's not just coast. Let's do sine. You'll find out sine alpha, sine beta, some indifference. Only difference between them was the phase. Sine here, cosine there. Negative here, positive here, or sorry, add here, subtract there. That's all just different. The main concept, sum and difference. About in science, so you're mixing them. I shouldn't use the word mix. You're uh, covering all the bases. Two sines, two coses, a sine cos or a cosine. We'll just cover all the bases. Same thing, sum and difference. Only difference might be you're taking sines, cosines, you're adding or subtracting. Sum and difference still. Ditto. You know what that means? It's a Pokemon. <laughs> oh, I didn't know it's a Pokemon. It means same as before. Anybody know about Singapore's telephone book? You'll see do in their listing. It means ditto. It's a short for, for ditto, same as before. There, it exists in, tel in the old it's a telephone book. It's one book. <laughs> so two things we can project our const digital constellation onto the two axes using simple sine and cos projections that's one thing and totally different thing we can Take the product of two waves, called sinusoidal waves, and get the sum of difference. It's called mixing. Sometimes it's nicer to look in the complex domain with a complex uh, notation. So you know this order. You could write e to the j theta equals cos theta plus j sine theta. Theta is in radians. Never forget that. It's not in degrees. J is the square root of negative one. Just plug in a couple simple cases. I always like to take formula, plug in some cases. Does that make sense? Theta of zero, sine theta of one. Should be one, right? One. Pi by two. Next one should be k. K.
Now, usually in communications or even signal processing, we don't leave it at theta. We set theta equals omega t. Did I set that somewhere? Oh, right here. Omega is the angular frequency, and t is time variable. You know time in seconds. Omega is 2 pi f, so radial frequency or 2 pi times the uh, cycles per second frequency. So you can plug in often theta to be omega t. And here's just a few examples setting this up to do those projections again, but this time in the complex notation. And then we're, and then we're done this section. Let's go and look at the complex cosine. I don't think you have anything to write down, maybe. So if we added 3 and 4, you can write 2 cos omega t in that terms. Cos is the sum of two uh, Euler formatted terms. Let's look at that vectorially. You got a real axis, imaginary. What does that mean vectorially? It means take your first vector, e to the j omega t, that's this vector, and add e to the minus negative j omega t. How do you add vectors? Two vectors. You take head to tail. So take the second one, for example, tail to head, move it up there, and that's the addition. 2 times, um, I think it was B on the first page. That's why the half is there, to bring the B back to the, project, to the, reg, the uh, projection, the cosine. So add two vectors like that. And sign. Let's subtract four from three. Now we want to add those two vectors or subtract them. The way to do that is you add, take the first one and add the negative of the second one. That's subtract. So the first one is the green one. The second one is this dotted green. But we don't add that, we will add the negative of that. How do you get the negative of the vector? Mm -hmm. Reverse it 180 degrees, right? So that's why this 2a is the summation of those two. Divide by 2 to bring it back down to a. So now we did all the basics. We, what did we do? We did trig projections onto the two-dimensional plane. We did uh, mixing. We did favor objectable. It is? Actually, you don't look like you agree. <laughs> <laughs> oh, maybe DBV or DBM is it? And logarithms, that's the basis of decibels. And we also looked at spectrum at the spectrum, going from time to frequency. Any questions on this before we go and look at the signal to noise ratio we left off at? No? Let's see if I can go to one note. The question was, 
what's the SNR, the signal to noise ratio of the above signal, tell us in dB and just as non-logarithmic ratio. Is it fair to ask for the ratio in dB? It's not fair. dB represents a ratio, right? So it is fair. Remember what dB is. Decibels are a tenth log of a ratio. That ratio, the ratio of two powers. So it is fair to ask. Tell us the signal to noise ratio in dB. And also get rid of the 10 log and tell us what the ratio is. So two things. Did anybody get an answer? Yeah, I got something too. <laughs> you want to go? Yeah. 8.45. 8.5 dB. How much? 8.5 dB. 8.5. Anyone else? I got 6.7. dB. Oh, ratio? Uh, uh, Ratio, I got 57 dB. Or sorry, decibels, I got 57 decibels. And, and was yours dBs or ratio? Yeah, it was dB. Yeah. So 8.5 dB. Yeah. I got 6 for the ratio. Not the dB, but the ratio? Yeah, the ratio. 6. I got 6. Well, one of you sounds right. More or less. Let's take a look. <laughs> Let's take a look. How do you figure that out? Is there really enough information to get a number for there? There is. That's the important thing. We don't know the reference level. That's the level of the top line in measured in dBm. dBm is a power, right? dBm is not a ratio. It's a ratio. Sorry, it's a measurement of the power derived from a ratio related to milliwatts. Milliwatts. So dBm, you tell me the dBm, you're telling me the power. But we don't know that. We don't know the so we could assume it's zero. It doesn't matter. 20, 30, negative pi, whatever it is, make it easier, we'll just call it zero. It really doesn't matter. We want to know the height of that tip to the noise. That's it. Somebody asked me a very good question after. I don't know who it was. Do, where do, how do you measure noise? Signal is going to be that tip, probably that's no surprise, but how about the noise? It's a whole variable. Take the average with your eyes for this. That's it. Just take your average with your eyes. I would say the average is about the white line, roughly. So just count 10 dB. One, two, three, four, five point, five point eight divisions. Equal fifty-eight dB. Here's the dB. You said fifty-seven. That's pretty close. When you start in, do your with your eyes. It's okay. Fifty-seven. 50, 50. <laughs> Makes sense. How to do it? You want to do it uh, differently? You say. Oh, that's zero. So it's 10 dB. So zero. How high is that? Let's figure out the signal height. Let's call that S. Let's call that N. I should use a different color, right? So let's try a different color. Green. Question. Yep. When you say N dB and as a ratio, is that a trick? Is that a trick construction? No. So dB. You're saying dB is a ratio. dB represents a ratio okay. in the logarithmic domain. Okay. So do this one. No trick. So what's 10 log of the ratio and what ratio is the question. That's all. Oh, so you think, you probably came thinking I'd give tricky questions. I remember you put this. Yeah. <laughs> in 3800? Yeah. I'm just trying to make up questions. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Very difficult. Yeah. I, I used to give more tricky questions in different over the years. And I realized, okay, because I'm kind of a nerdy introvert. You know, give me puzzle books. I like little tricks. 
Not, not everyone, I realize not everyone was like that. <laughs> 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 I think we like that when we've got a couple hours. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> but if it's on the test. <laughs> one minute. Yeah, you yeah. back. How do you feel? No, no, I, I never, I never had well, you know, sort of worries with my partner. So obviously, well, I do have a question for you though. Yeah. Um, could you tell me why my logic is wrong? Because when I saw this question, I was, I was like, okay, signal to noise is kind of familiar to me in, in music, and I was just like, how much signal to how much noise? I just counted like estimated six squares vertically to one square of noise so it's just like six to one with my signal to noise oh yeah but each grid is yeah. 10 db but i thought that was it would be irrelevant because it's a ratio so it's, it's six no to 10. it's not it's no. like six to ten it's like 60 to 10. it's 60 to 10. right yeah, but it's a ratio you have to think about how they want the difference in so Let's do so S to N yeah, now. Let's go. Like and then I went the next step. Once I had that ratio of 6 to 1, 60 to 10, I just took oh, 10 okay. log of that ratio. So I'm just wondering why that doesn't make sense. Instead right. of answering that, let's just do it the other way, the, a bit longer, and find out what S and N are. Cool. But we don't know what S is because we don't know the reference level. Let's assume one. Right. Let's say it's zero. Assume. So that reference level is zero, what? DBM. Right there. So what is S? S equals zero DBM minus about 12 dB. Do you agree? Can you mix units like that? We're not actually mixing units, we're just doing what we can with dBs. That's a power, that's a ratio, and if you read that one sheet I posted, hopefully that'll help you realize that's perfectly okay. So I estimated 12 by looking, hmm, 1.2 divisions, 10 dB per division, about 12. So that's negative 12 dBm. Is that okay? Can we? No uh, objection. So what's N? N equals zero dBm minus some amount, mum, <clears throat> some amount of dB. Let's see, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60. I'll just take the white line to be easy, about 70. 70 dB. DBM or power? No ratio. Isn't that the noise floor, not the noise? Isn't there a difference between noise floor and noise? Like yes and no. Noise floor means probably the analyzer itself, but it's noise. It's just the lowest noise possible. If you had a noiseless signal, you're going to get the noise floor. If your no signal has any noise, you just pop that up. Okay. Yeah. So noise floor is the noise of the analyzer. So let's go for the ratio. S minus N negative 12 minus negative 70, did I say? Yeah. Equals 58 what units? D, B, M? <clears throat> no M. Correct, no M. That's the trick. That I play. But then I immediately tell you, I don't let it linger. When I try to treat. So, are you saying that the rate, the ratio itself, is actually like six hundred thirty-one thousand? Yes. So <laughs> we'll do that in a sec. So, are you happy now, Clinton? Yeah, thank you. So it's fifty-eight. We got it two different ways. What's the ratio? Reverse the formula. Why is oh, because it's my sweat. 
it actually sweated me. Ratio. 10 to the 58 divided by 10. You remember where the 10 came from? This 10. We're just undoing it. 10 to the 5.8. 630, I wrote it down for myself. Six hundred thirty thousand to one is the ratio. I always like to double check my answers. Don't just use a calculator. Hmm, ten to the five point. That's about ten to the six, right? You know, ten to the six is a million. You know, it's a bit less. You better get something a bit less than a million. Always try to check your answers in any electrical engineering. Just come at it a little bit different and see, is that correct? Is that in a ballpark where I physically think it would be? Where I think it would be that makes sense? I always like to check those things. By coming at it slightly different. So this is probably a good idea that we came at this two different ways. One is the green way where we kind of went through all the numbers, and the other way we did it quicker. Uh, I don't know where we did it quicker. We just counted, I just counted on the screen. Are we good on the, that one? So in the lab, you would literally see a screen like this. And uh, I think in the lab one, you're asked, you've got a signal, but you have another one here. What's that ratio between the two? You should be able to do that now, for sure. The confusing thing, like I mentioned before, can be the strange mixing of units. Two dBms subtracted became a dB. It's not strange because it's correct. It just looks kind of weird. Oh, you can't you can have units like that. But just remember what a dB is. It's a logarithmic expression. And all you're doing when you subtract is you divide logarithmically. That's what a ratio is. Subtract is a divide. You can take a little bit of time to feel comfortable. Jack, guess. Um, good question. For the, the answer there is it's 630,957 to 1, not 1 mil, right? Because the. Uh, not one million? Not like one, because it's, we're not doing like DBM, so it's not a, a power over one noble or one. No, one. there was, there's no, mm, um, there's no, uh, we know that on the screen, This is calibrated in some, you know, the y-axis is some power. It doesn't actually matter what it is. We're just taking the ratio of that tip to that average. Okay. There's no dBMs or anything to worry about in the ratio. Oh, it's just, it's just the ratio. So. Sometimes you can call it a linear ratio to get it away from the word logarithm. Any more question? Is maybe gentlemen. That's how I can remember. Yes. Uh, that's where my dad got it from. Well, your full name's gentleman? No. <laughs> <laughs> you need to work for that. Yeah. <laughs> so I want to talk about the spectrum analysis. I think I noted it in here. Yeah. What does a spectrum analyzer look like? This is a simplified block diagram. That means probably this showing the essential elements, but a real one's going to have all kinds of lists. But basically, this is the structure. Okay. 
Yeah. What's the goal of the spectrum analyzer? Remember what the goal is. Let's back up. What's the goal of oscilloscope? Show the amount of voltage versus time, correct? Everything else, like triggering and levels and horizontal scales, are little frills. <laughs> we're trying to look at the voltage versus time. Here, we're trying to look at the power versus frequency. So this is and often the power is dBm, meaning referred to a milliwatt. That's the goal. In radio frequency communications, uh, you might want to look at a zoom in and look at a little range of frequencies. You can't look at necessarily the whole spectrum at once. It's just too big and it would be so crowded you would you want to be able to zoom in horizontally. So you want to be able to pick off one of the frequency bands in the air for, or in your signal. How do you pick it off? You use the mixing that we just talked about. So this is a, uh, what's being done. So don't worry about this stuff. Let's just look, what does the mixer do? Here's your input signal. I just drew a sine wave, but it doesn't, it could be a whole bunch of sine waves. It could be noise, it could be all kinds of signals. I just drew a sine wave because look, a sine wave in the time domain becomes a spike in the frequency domain. You know that, I think. I get sine wave becomes an infinitely narrow spike. How could we get this, say, one gigahertz sine wave to display on our display? We're going to have to mix it down in frequency using the mixing action. What does the mixer do? Look at this inside of the circle. What's the letter or, or the symbol? Multiply, right? We know if we put in a cosine here, and this one happens to be a cosine, alpha and beta right there, and we take the product, we know now what happens trigonometrically, mathematically. You get two frequencies, the difference frequency, the signal at the different frequency, and the signal at summation frequency. You don't believe me? We just saw this repeat. Two courses, you get this, and these represent frequencies omega d like frequencies. There's the sum of the two frequencies, cosine again. There's the difference. That's what the mixture does. Okay, we, we have the sum and difference Great, but if we displayed both of them, we'd have a crazy display. We need to get rid of one of them. Which one do we want to get rid of? We're coming down in frequency. We want to get rid of the sum. How? We said before, filter. That's the filter. It's called the IF or intermediate frequency filter. It will be uh, centered it's bandpass filter. Is that a bandpass? It's a cross, yes, no, suppression. The, the little three, that's my style. Or that's the one of the styles, sorry. We can't take ownership for that. So this will get rid of the sum. The sum is suppressed. There's the difference. We have the one sine wave, cosine or sine wave, but we want its power. How do you detect power? Very simply, a diode could be used to detect power. And then put it into the y-axis of the display. So now you could think of this as a scope whose y-axis is this power signal. 
and whose x-axis is a times sawtooth waveform that must somehow correspond to the frequency we're looking at. Yes, it is, because it drives something called the voltage control also. So this is probably a bit complicated, but you'll understand it more and more. It is sir. Your journey date. But you look like to me. <laughs> so I put the glasses. <laughs> Maybe not. Who are you? I'm Mike Andrews. Oh, you're Mike Andrews. Okay. Yeah. You'll never know if you have that you every day. Yeah, you could be, you could switch, right? Got the good Question, Michael? Um, yeah, I'm just curious how how does a diode detect power culture? Put it in. Diode. Okay. Average. So there's a little averaging filter. Oh, okay. so there's not being shown. Oh. Yeah. Cool. Thanks. I comfort myself by saying simplify. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm assuming there's a lot more than that. Oh, yeah. Good question. <laughs> yeah, for example, there's not just one IA filter, there could be a bank of them, it could be programmable. Uh, there's all kinds of extra features, but this is the bare bones. So what's a voltage controlled oscillator? That's like the last piece. It means if you put in a voltage V of T, you get out a frequency. Like a cosine. So if we put in a DC, let's break it to a DC level, you'll get one cosine of some frequency up until we change the input voltage. Then we'll get another one. You increase the voltage, you increase the frequency up. What are we doing? We're driving it with a sawtooth that goes up in voltage, meaning the frequency goes up, meaning you can use that sawtooth to drive the X to be in sync with what we're looking at. So it's driving the VCO, this SO2, and then driving the X synchronously. Now we can have a plot in real, in uh, continuous updating time of power versus frequency. That in a nutshell is a spectrum analyzer. The one in the 82, this is like the one in the lab. The one in the 82, is FFT based. Uh, I don't want to really go into that today, but you really should understand even even the one in even new spectrum analyzers in the lab. They're going to have this mixing because you can't do FFTs at this high frequency. You just can't do that. Yes, FFT fast Fourier transform. It's a way of going from time domain in the sample time, like digital uh, sample time, to frequency. What is like the physical components of the laser? Like how do you build a... Ah, wow, very good question. We're actually looking at that. But the, for today, I'll just say you need a nonlinearity to produce a multiply action. So you, you get it, like you can drive a field effect transistor, Think about a field effect transistor. Do you study the, the law? The transfer function is a square. Do you remember that? Maybe. You do? Glinda? Yeah. That's pretty impressed. Anyway, you, you get a device <laughs> that's going to nonlinearly uh, modify the input or the two inputs. Nonlinear means there's going to be a product in there. So there will be a product, and you get rid of all the other unwanted products. How? Filter. So that's sort of a simple description. Okay. Uh, remember I drew a picture Where did I draw that? Oh, right here. If you have an ideal sine wave going into your spectrum analyzer, ideally it would be an infinitely narrow spike that you would see in the display. But you don't, you see a, 
some width to it. That is the IF that we just talked about, the IF intermediate frequency filter, the band pass filter. That's the same thing. So I posted an eight-minute video. Who watched it so far? Other than Clinton. A man watched it? I didn't watch it. <laughs> <laughs> You're an easy guy to, whose name is so easy to remember. <laughs> but I don't understand. Well, I shouldn't say <laughs> you didn't watch it okay. In that video, eight minutes, I put that so you don't get intimidated. It's a YouTube video where the person takes a cardboard cutout and talks about that width come from. But he goes a little further, talks about what if you had two of them, right? Two signals. Are you going to be able to see them? Are they going to be separated? You have to set what's a certain parameter that you will see in the video. So he has the cardboard cut out. He moves it along his fur, and you'll see where the width comes from very easily. So just back to this briefly. I wanted to mention that Maybe not the AB2, but the one in the lab. You might have a signal, but you might see a big DC. It looks like a big spike of DC. So this is frequency, this is DC, this is some frequency. That DC spike is an artifact. That means it's not, it's real, but it has no, it's not from your signal. It's from the analyzer. You can ignore it. Also, some analyzers, because of the mixing, you'll actually get negative frequencies, and you can actually scroll over there. Don't get confused about that. You might want to just set everything up so your, your span and what you're looking at, so you don't see the DC and you don't see the negatives. That's all. I don't think I have AD2 that has that. Uh, one more thing to say. Oh, okay. So this analyzer stuff reminds me when I was a grad student at the Radio Observatory near Penticton. Did anybody know this? The Radio Observatory? I lived there by myself for many months. That's <laughs> why I'm a bit... <laughs> Literally by myself. Seven days a week. Where is it? 25k from Penticton in, oh, in the mountains. The observatory does, right? Yeah, yeah. By Twin Lakes. Near Twin Lakes Golf Course or whatever. Yeah. Is that the picture you showed us when you were working on things with antennas? Oh, that's the place. I oh, I showed you. Okay. But pretty sure I didn't tell you. In those days, the spectrum analyzer had a cathode ray tube, and the thing is among. And it's too heavy to lift. It's midnight. By myself, and uh, <clears throat> I want to move it from building A to building B, which is about half a kilometer. <laughs> and they, <laughs> why is that funny? <laughs> so there's a giant T shaped antenna, 1K by 1K, and each telephone pole of that antenna is guys, steel guys, and there's one path through. For a vehicle. One path. There's no lights. I knew there's a path through. So rather than going from building A to B in a rectilinear fashion, I want to save time and go with the hypotenuse. <laughs> and stupid, I was pretty stupid. <laughs> My Plymouth Arrow, I loaded this thing and I went as fast as I could backwards. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> it goes like this. I went forwards to move the analyzer, but you can't get out of the maze. You have to go back through it. And so without the analyzer, now I went as fast as I could backwards. Why as fast as you could? <laughs> That's what's so stupid. <laughs> I don't know. I was just that kind of person. And I hit the car water. And it was like you hit a wall. 
I didn't bring down the pole, but I, my Plymouth Arrow hatchback had the V-shape, huge V-shape. And I spent a month studying bodywork in the library of that taking to try to figure out how to fix it. I never actually fixed it. Very well. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, that's what I think of when I think of those big analyzers. They're so heavy, and I put it in, and I, oh, yeah, let's move it. <laughs> and it's not a straight road. Right? You can tell them what happened. You can tell them what happened. No, no, I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> I can tell you about uh, the arrow in the winter and walking kilometers to get back to where I live all by myself. That's a, that's a winter storm story. Like, you know the misery? The movie Misery? Oh, a guy, yeah. James Conn crashes and then he gets saved by it. It's sort of like that. Yes, Clint? Uh, I think Set T has your lab on Tuesday coming up next week. Is there anything we should prep for that lab? I'm going to, uh, this was part of the prep. So instead of having you prep, I will tell you. So I'm designing that lab. You see, I'm glad you mentioned the lab. That room is very small and claustrophobic. And I personally don't want 16 or there about students in there for your own sake. COVID, it's related to COVID. It's just my way of thinking. So I've decided to make the lab one hour, you go in that room, half the set. And the other hour is you do the 82 on your own. You can do it during that hour or at home, and you have a week to handle it. So you get, you use the spectrum analyzer on the bench, the good one, and you use the 82. So you end up using both, which I think is better. For this lab, is that actually? I don't even remember what your question. Was. You, yeah, well, not that set, but you want a certain. Oh, prep, prep. That was your. Yeah. Answer. Learn how to use the eighty-two. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Get, which I think you already know. I said, Lord.